<clears throat> These are some updates from Chrome. And uh, my name is David, and I am a product manager for the Chrome extensions uh, ecosystem uh, at Google. And over the course of this presentation, you'll hear from a number of members of our team, uh, ranging from DevRel to other eng leads that are responsible for the platform as well as the Chrome Web Store. And today, we're here to talk to you about some of the really cool things that we have been working on, uh, as well as some of the things that are coming up for Chrome and for the extensions ecosystem overall. All right. So I see a lot of familiar faces from last year here. Uh, and I've talked to a, a lot of folks here. But for anybody who is new, um, a quick refresher on what happened last year. Fortunately, I can go through this section pretty quickly. Uh, earlier today, I believe Dimitri had shown like a timeline and other stuff. So I think like there's some context that's already been set with what previously we've announced. But uh, in Last year's presentation, we had already disallowed new Manifest V2 extensions from being submitted to the store. And uh, we had shared a deprecation timeline. It was a series of dates, um, and we asked for feedback. What would happen? Uh, how do you feel? Are we ready to move on to Manifest V3? Uh, and we wanted to hear from all of you in the audience here. And. We heard your feedback, as well as the feedback of the other members of the developer community as they started migrating their extensions and running into roadblocks and telling us about their experiences. And we listened. And because we listened, uh, we made adjustments to the plan. Uh, and it's been alluded to earlier, but I want to summarize what some of those adjustments were. The most important one and the most impactful one is that we paused the timeline for the Manifest V2 deprecation. Uh, I believe earlier it says it's unknown. Um, yes, we had paused it indefinitely until uh, we can resolve some of the quality issues that, uh, and challenges that many of you had brought to our attention. So we paused the, the timeline to focus on the quality and the robustness of the platform. We want to make migration as straightforward and as easy as possible. Um, and so. That is what we are continuing to do. Uh, uh, and more importantly, we not only did that, uh, but we continued to make improvements to not just the stuff that you mentioned to us, but other things that we've gathered were areas of improvement. And you'll hear about some of those later on today from members of our team. Secondly, we increased developer outreach. So we increased not only the rate of outreach to the developer community, because we heard a lot of great feedback. But we also tried changing up and increasing the number of channels, uh, increasing our investment, for instance, in the web extensions community group, uh, as well as trying out trying out uh, like a focus group, a panel of focus group members. Thank you for uh, the feedback uh, in those sessions. I believe in that trial. Uh, members from Adblock Plus and AdGuard teams were there. So we're trying out different ways of engaging with the developer community. And then finally, our last tweak involved something that's like more subtle for this particular audience, but it relates to our enterprise policy. So for enterprises who deploy extensions to uh, the managed devices as part of their enterprise, we uh, originally had the timeline of uh, of when they can enable policy to keep Manifest V2 continuing to work tied with uh, some of our existing uh, timeline. But we've since split off that. We've shipped the policy. They can just uh, turn that on whenever they'd like and just not think about the timeline for a little while. And now we're in a really pretty good position. We believe all major known issues have been addressed. There continues to be additional feedback. We know that there's additional feature requests. Uh, but much of the feedback now that we're hearing are relatively smaller issues, uh, bugs, rather than like entirely missing pieces of functionality. Um, the adoption has been going pretty well as well. The majority of all extension installs um, now on user devices are running Manifest v3 um, for extensions all up. And we've seen new experiences flourish in the store, and many new feature requests from new developers are unrelated to migrating to Manifest v3 or features that were available in Manifest v2. Um, speaking of new experiences, 
gen generative AI is very popular and uh, we now have many new generative AI extensions that are in our store. Um, that, and that topic has been covered. I, I heard some coverage of that yesterday. Uh, with that trend comes new vectors of abuse uh, and new areas of controversy, but also with this new influx of extensions, we're seeing evidence of Manifest V3 being a more scalable platform from a security and abuse fighting perspective, and it's helped us better uh, figure out the, the ways that we can protect the ecosystem from new forms of abuse. Uh, and one thing before I pass it on to the rest of the members of our team is that I want to emphasize that uh, I talked about Manifest V3 because I know that that's a hot topic of concern here, um, but Manifest V3 exists uh, amongst a whole host of other changes meant for the security and privacy of the ecosystem. So among that, we are also investing in a new extension menu UI to bring improved and clearer privacy controls to end users. We uh, are doing changes in privacy sandbox. Uh, we have additional safety check feed functionality. That's the screenshot that you see today. We're trying to encourage users to review items that have been maybe taken down or unpublished extensions from the store. Um, and as Natasha covered yesterday in the policy talk, there's a lot of new compliance coming down the pipeline and we want to make sure that that is uh, as straightforward as possible for developers to accommodate. Um, and so it's coming down the pipeline as well. Expect to hear more soon. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to uh, my colleague, Sherry, to talk more about the web store. Thank you, David. Uh, can you hear me? OK. Thank you, David. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Chen. Uh, I'm a founder and now the engineering lead and manager of the Chrome Web Store, uh, which is a store developers submit extensions, Chrome extensions and, and themes. Um, so I'm really glad to be here today, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to show you uh, some of our, our updates uh, in the past year. So besides uh, stay on top of trust and safety and compliance, uh, we have completely upgraded our store. We introduced improved discovery to better connect extensions to their potential users. I will talk more about this one in the next slides. And uh, because of this new infrastructure, we are also able to build more features for developers. This includes the uh, automatic review, if your extension has a DNR, uh, DNR rule only changes, uh, and also version rollback. Um, we introduced more like transparency. So David talked about the DSA regulation just now. And uh, from next year, uh, the store would mandate traders to verify their information. And we will pass this, this information about if a publisher is verified to our users. And so users tend to trust extensions from those like verified publisher more. So this is actually a good opportunity because besides store's own verification, developers can also use the uh, dance and bright street, like dance number to verify. Uh, yeah, so our store is, new store is in public preview. So everyone can go to the homepage and opt in to use this new store. Please try it out and give us feedback through the three dots menu. Um, you can also directly go to the chromewebstore.google.com. The design principle of a new store is to improve the overall trans, uh, trustworthiness and discovery. So users can now find extensions easier thanks to the new extension category. And for example, the ad filtering extensions used to be in the productivity category, right? It's a very generic one, mixed with a large group of other extensions. And uh, for someone who want to find extensions because they want more privacy, it may be hard. Now we introduce this like a new privacy and security category. And it's more easier for a user to just go there and find the extension they want. Um, and uh, talking about the trustworthiness, um, you can see that we have changes to make the featured extensions more prominent to users. Uh, so for example, in this case, the 
autocomplete scenario. If this is a, like a featured extension, means that like the higher quality ones that we verified, uh, we will show their title and icon together on the top, and then for the rest, uh, who are not really like the, the featured extension, they are shown at the bottom, just raw string. And by the way, our featured extension doesn't mean they are ads. They're just like those that we have already verified have high quality, and also uh, we apply a higher standard when we do the review in each of their updates. And so we can totally trust them to recommend to users. And in th this example, um, we learn from UXR about what information users care when they make decision um, to, to choose uh, their extension. So we just ensure those information are really clear to our users. And compare this like old and new UI, you see the user rating is now immediately readable. Um, yeah, you should totally try the store, completely refresh. But I think like these features, uh, like developers would want to see those, right? First, we remove the user count cap. We used to have, we used to have a, like a 10 million cap. And now we still round the number, but there's no longer a cap. And we started using a higher resolution graphic assets, like screenshots and small tiles, without need uh, the developer to re-upload. Um, we have also finished implementing the per item privacy URL. So you know today, publishers have a single URL for their uh, privacy policy applied to other items. Um, but then like next week, when we like, launch this one, you can use a per item one. Talking about upcoming changes, uh, we've learned that you have concerns about uh, potential review delays um, when moving, migrating to MV3 often means you need to update your extensions often. And so as soon as we were able to like, build on top of our new infrastructure, uh, we started the two projects. The first one is fast tracking declarative net request changes. So if the changes only include those like safe rules that we have confidence, right, that's safe, and this one can get fast review really, really fast. And also the version rollback, you have UIs about the version rollback, if you skip all the reviews and uh, get published instantly. So yeah, with that, uh, I will pass to Devlin to talk about the uh, platform changes. Thank you. Hey folks, uh, it's good to be back. I, I think that I recognize a lot of folks out there. So for those that don't know me, I'm Devlin. I, I am the uh, technical lead manager of the Chrome extensions platform team, so the, the portion that's kind of built into the browser. And I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the browser in the last year since we were last here. So one of the big things that we've been focusing on is providing well-lit paths for people to migrate to Manifest V3. So we heard you loud and clear as David said that there were a lot of rough edges, that even though some of the functionality was there, there were a lot of challenges that we had to face. And I think that uh, Dimitri also went into a lot of detail about those and the types of things that were difficult to, to circumvent. And we've been spending the last year trying to make that easier, trying to make it uh, so that you could migrate to Manifest V3 with a lot less of that, that difficulty and those hurdles to get over. So a few of the things that we did in that area were enhancing service workers. So by far, the, the service worker lifetime was one of the, the areas that developers were very, very vocal about saying that it was unreasonably difficult to try and work with the previous model. And we took that feedback to heart. And so we, we made a lot of changes to there. And Dimitri alluded to them where now the service worker, as long as it's doing work, it can stay alive in the browser indefinitely. There, there isn't a five minute limit. It will just stay around and continue processing that data. And it will only go to sleep if truly it is idle. Uh, we also provided more support in service workers for web APIs, things like WebSockets, where now if there's an open WebSocket connection, the service worker is going to stay alive while that WebSocket connection is active. We instrumented what we're calling strong keepalize for certain API calls, where if that API call shows some sort of user interface that's going to require the user to make a decision, something like a permissions prompt, the service worker will stay alive as long as that's open because it would be really awkward to kill it. Uh, and then we're also working on opening up new APIs that were previously disabled for service workers for various technical reasons to service workers. So the tab capture API, for instance, is one that we enabled in that service worker context. 
Along with that though, we know that service workers still can't solve everything. In particular, there's, there's no DOM in service workers and that's probably not gonna change anytime soon. So with that, we know that there's a lot of these use cases that are fundamentally tied to the interaction with the DOM. Last year we had talked about off-screen documents and it was a proposal that we had that we were kind of iterating on. Since then, we launched these to stable. We identified a bunch of reasons that you might want to open up an off-screen document. DOM scraping and iframe embedding is one of the really, really easy ones. But there's a ton of other things that don't yet work in service workers that we want to make sure you can have a way to do in Manifest V3. Along with this though, there's a lot of these that we think would be better if we just brought them to service workers. And that's one of the reasons that we also wanted to have service workers as this background context, was to align with the web and engage in this virtuous circle where as the web gets better and service workers get better on the web, extensions get better. And also we can make extensions, uh, sorry, service workers better on the web. So as we might be able to enable some of these things, we can move them from the off-screen document to the extension service worker, but also enable that for the web platform and make that better as well. We also worked on adding built-in support for, for user scripts. So user scripts were a really challenging one for Manifest V3 because in Manifest version 3, you're not supposed to have remotely hosted code executed. And that's kind of the entire point of a user script manager. So that was one of the things that we really had to balance and figure out what is the right way to do that. And one of the things that we decided on was we wanted to provide better built-in support, first party support for user scripts in Manifest V3. So we iterated with the, the different browser vendors around this and there was a lot of discussion and I really liked what Ben said in his talk yesterday about lots of back and forth. Might look like arguing, it's discussing, it's fine. Uh, but it's also how standards bodies are supposed to work. It's how this discussion is supposed to go. In the web extensions community group, we worked with the browser vendors, we worked with user script managers, we worked with a lot of people in this room to figure out what is an API that would work to allow those Manifest V2 user script managers to migrate over to Manifest V3. And with this, there's not only a path forward for them to migrate, but also they'll get increased security benefits. And this is something that we can also look towards enhancing to make their job easier, more robust, more capable, to patch some of those holes that exist in Manifest V2 and make it difficult to know that your user script is going to inject as you expect it to. And we're working on this first version of the API and it'll be coming to Canary pretty soon. Along with that though, we didn't just want to make Manifest V3 better for the Manifest V2 things that already existed. The whole point of Manifest V3 wasn't, yeah, extensions are great, let's make everyone do a lot of work and get the same thing we had. I know sometimes it looks like that, that's not the intention. We, we wanted to have a platform that was going to be scalable, that was going to be something that we could evolve for years to come, that was going to be something that we could bring new user experiences to. And so even though a lot of our focus has been on that kind of area of making it easier for you to migrate, making things that worked in Manifest V2 easier to do in Manifest V3 and removing some of those hurdles, we also wanted to make sure that we're extending the platform and bringing new and delightful user experiences that you couldn't do before. One of the big ones that we talked about at I.O. was the side panel API. So the side panel is a new UI surface in Chrome and one of the new APIs that we added for it was the ability for extensions to embed content there. That was something that we heard a lot of developers being really, really excited about. For anyone who's worked on extensions for a really long time, you might remember the old experimental side panel API in Chrome back in like 2011. Uh, we finally got it right, we think. Uh, so you know, it takes a little while, but we get there. Uh, the side panel API is something that we've seen huge excitement around. We got a lot of really good feedback on, and we've seen incredible adoption of it with already hundreds of new extensions in the web store supporting the, the side panel surface. As well, we, we just implemented a, a bunch of random new updates that are just these small quality of life fixes that maybe were around fixing something that was awkward in Manifest V2 or maybe is just a slightly better version or maybe just is a slight capability tweak. So these are things like the, the get context API, the ability to set your own badge text color, um, changing a, a few aspects of declarative net requests where we changed the is URL filter case sensitive to false. Thank you to everyone in this room that provided valuable feedback on that. That was really, really useful to have. Um, we increased the, the Chrome storage session memory limits and of course we're, we're not done yet. We're looking at a lot more things that are still going to come. So obviously a big button issue, a hot button issue here is declarative net request. Dimitri, thank you very much again for all of your feedback there. Good news, a lot of those are already being taken into account. Uh, Oliver has been working on a safe rules proposal and with that, that will allow us to update a lot of the rule set limits and rule limits for dynamic rules and we can look at how we're going to do that and that also ties in with the fast tracking of declarative net request changes that Sherry alluded to. 
But in addition to the declarative net request changes, we're also looking at new APIs. So a few of these that are going to be coming down the pipe fairly soon here are around reading list integration, uh, new capabilities for the, the Chrome.dom API to help with script injection from a content script into the main world or communication with it, and file handling on Chrome OS. We're also, of course, looking into other APIs that are farther down the road that we're really excited about. And so we'll have more detail for you though there as they kind of get closer. And with that, I'll hand it over to Patrick to talk about some of the community updates. Thanks so much. Thank you, Devlin. As he said, my name is Patrick Kettner. I work on outreach for Chrome extensions, and I am thrilled to be here today. It's the first time I've been to Ad Filtering Dev Summit. I'm really, really excited about all the work that we've done in the last year, so I'd love to share what we've covered. Um, I think as it's been pretty clear, the major focus for all outreach with extensions in the last year has been Manifest V3. It's no wonder, it's a fundamental rethinking of how extensions work. As a result, a lot of the historical knowledge of how to you know, write an extension has changed. That's why a lot of our focus as a team has been updating the extensions uh, documentation website. We've been adding new concepts to the website, things like uh, service workers or promise-based APIs that historically weren't that relevant to a majority of extensions on the web now are because of Manifest V3. Uh, so we've, trying, we've been adding first class guides to make sure all extension developers know exactly how to use these new APIs or APIs that might be new for these use cases. Uh, additionally, we've been rethinking how to update existing guides. Uh, for example, through a lot of outreach both with direct Sorry, both direct outreach to extension developers and just kind of uh, unsolicited feedback we've gotten from mailing lists, we found out certain APIs like geolocation were more difficult in Manifest V3. See, Manifest V2, you have a DOM API access everywhere. Geolocation is a DOM specific API and doesn't really exist within a service worker. So we were able to write a guide that tells you how to use that inside of an off-screen document in the service worker or in the new side panel or any other uh, pop-up or content script. We wanna make sure that y'all have the tools you need to do whatever you want to do so you don't have to think about tooling. So thanks to your feedback, we've been able to do that with guides like this. Uh, additionally, we're working with libraries, both first party and third party, like Google Analytics and Firebase to make sure they're updated to get whatever you need to do your job. Uh, so there was a major change with Google Analytics this last year where they stopped supporting old universal analytics and they now support this completely new change with Google Analytics uh, 4 and we published a brand new guide on how to do that with extensions. It's great if you haven't updated, <laughs> if you're interested in analytics at least, uh, it's a great one to check out. So uh, you know all of those really collectively, are, it's not just about writing documentation though, it's about making sure that you all have the best developer experience possible, and so we've been adding new tweaks to the site. Uh, one of the smaller ones, but one of the ones I'm the most excited about was adding this new um, <clears throat> kind of interactive sample list. So if you're unfamiliar, we have dozens and dozens, or maybe hundreds at this point, of official extension samples where we show exactly how to use specific APIs, how to use specific permissions, the most efficient way to do those things, and they're all available on our site. Uh, historically, you had to just drill through the list manually. It was kind of a pain. We added a new interactive filter list, so now you can filter and jump specifically to one that's for that individual permission, that individual API, uh, whatever it may be, and they all get pulled in automatically from the uh, cr official Chromium extension samples uh, GitHub. If y'all aren't familiar with the GitHub, if you want to know how to do something in an extension and you can't figure out how to do it, please open an issue here. We can give you a sample on how the Chrome team officially thinks that that's a great way to do it. It's usually gonna be one of the most efficient ways to accomplish something, by all means. We please welcome feedback. Um, but we're not always just reacting to developer outreach. We do a lot of direct outreach uh, from us to developers. Um, for an example, uh, this year we started the Google Developer Experts Group for Chrome extensions. So if you're unfamiliar, the Google Developer Expert or GDE program is a way for external folks to Google, can come to Google. We communicate and find out what is most important to developers and help them learn about what we're trying to do to make things better. We can try to get our product better from their feedback and vice versa. Uh, we were able to launch a GDE program uh, this year for web extensions. We have uh, over a dozen extension uh, GDEs from around the world that can now get feedback. It's a very exciting time for the program and I'm really happy to see it grow. Um, not only that, we've been doing a random developer check-in. So 
some of the people in this room I know have been the uh, uh, victims of my cold call emailing directly asking for feedback. You know, how has extensions uh, treating you? Do you like the platform? Has Manifest V3 been a problem for you? How can we make things better? Are there missing APIs? Something I've done to over a thousand extensions on the web, both large and small, just trying to find out whether or not things are working. We're not just reaching out to major extensions or random extensions or my friend's extensions or my mother's or anything else. It's really just the widest swath possible. And this is not a one-way street by all means. You can cannot annoy me with feedback. Please, you can contact me directly and you can find out exactly what you want and we will try to make it for you. Because again, we're working on the tools so that you don't have to think about your tools. We want to be invisible. We just want you to be productive and make the things that actually make the internet better. I'm trying to make that happen for you. Um, but that is done by you know, collecting feedback and assisting uh, Manifest V3 migration. Now, in addition to direct one-on-one -on -one feedback, we also this concept of a focus group. Um, the focus group at Chrome is a long living thing. We've had this idea of a Chrome product council. It's where Google would bring in representatives from all kinds of different verticals, whether it be e-commerce, education, social, uh, social uh, networks, or user privacy, just it, it, anything that makes up a part of the, the web for most people, we try to bring them in there. And we give them updates on the web platform, things that are completely public and available, and make sure that we are not going in the wrong direction. We want to make sure we are giving what people want on the web. It's how they can realistically get a lot of the latest news and collect their feedback. You know, People that aren't necessarily focused on technologically focused products can get a little bit behind in web technology, so we want to make sure that they have what they need to be successful. Uh, it's been so successful that we actually were able to launch a Chrome extension specific uh, product council earlier this year. We had uh, 40 different extensions, I feel like, or representatives from around 40 different extensions uh, join us, and it was great. It was so successful, we were able to uh, shrink it even more and create a crypto extension focused one uh, later, a few months later. And I'm actually really excited we're going to be doing a ad filtering and user privacy uh, product council later this year. If anyone here is interested in signing up for it, uh, you can go to that link or scan that QR code to find out more. Uh, this would just be a way to share feedback collectively as people that are particularly passionate about uh, ad blocking, about ad filtering, about anything involving user privacy and Chrome extensions. Please, I encourage you to sign up so we can communicate and figure out how to make things better, You know, how to amplify your voice collectively as a group to make sure that browsers give you what you want. Um, now, a lot of the outreach that we have been doing is focused on individual companies, individual developers, to make sure that we can try to assess what that works, uh, how things work with everyone. And uh, another major part of that, though, is working directly with browsers. Uh, you know, I'm incredibly happy and proud to be a part of the, uh, the Web Extensions Community Group, the WECG, and uh, I'd like to invite my colleague Oliver to up to the stage to give an update on what exactly the WECG has been doing. Thanks, Patrick. I'm really excited about all of that work that we're doing with the community. My name's Oliver. I'm a developer relations engineer, so I work with Patrick and the rest of the team uh, and really just try and bring your feedback about Chrome extensions to the rest of Chrome as a whole. I'm really excited because I get to talk to you today about the Web Extensions Community Group. This is a group that was founded in 2021 by Simeon Vincent, who was at Google at the time, and Timothy Hatcher from Apple. And the idea is that this is an opportunity for browser vendors, extension developers, and just generally interested members of the community to come together and talk about extensions. And I wanted to share a few numbers, actually. So since the last Ad Filtering Developer Summit, we've had 28 meetings. And that's 28 hours where we've been able to get together, we've been able to talk about what's on our mind, and we've been able to really try and make some progress on evolving the, the platform. So that's something that I'm, I'm really proud of, the fact that uh, we have a community that's willing to come together and to make that time to to discuss. And actually, speaking of the community, there are now 161 participants signed up to the group, which is a huge number and I think really exciting. And actually, I checked this morning and that number has gone up to 162. So if you've just joined, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, and in general, in the group, we have over its lifetime had over 300 issues opened. So that's a, a whole wide ranging set of topics that we've been able to discuss in the group. Uh, some of those, there's, there's still discussion to be had. Some of them we've actually resolved and been able to make changes in the browsers. Uh, but in general, I think this is just a really exciting time to be in the extensions ecosystem and to be working together. Uh, as I say on this slide, I think one of the big focuses over the last year has just been working to make web extension APIs more consistent across browsers. But on top of that, we've also been able to bring some proposals to the group. So just in the last year, the user scripts API, runtime.getContext, the reading list API, 
These are all APIs that previously may have gone through a browser-specific proposal process, but we've actually been able to take them to the group, to talk about them uh, between everyone, and to really sort of shape that API so that the API that we end up with is an API that we're all excited about. I also want to talk a little bit about TPAC. So this is W3C's annual conference. We were lucky enough to get to attend a few weeks ago in Seville in Spain. And this was a really great opportunity to work together face to face. So there was in-person attendance from Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and a number of members of the community. Thank you to everyone who came. And we had some really good discussions, which I definitely couldn't summarize all of them here. Actually, I think one of the, the themes I, I would say that came from the event was that we didn't have enough time, and next time we should schedule more, because in the time we, we had, we completely filled it. But I wanted to share some highlights. So uh, we discussed moving from the Chrome namespace to browser. So there's a single cross-browser namespace for accessing extension APIs. And there's still some work to do here. I don't want to make it sound like this is something that's going to happen tomorrow, but I'm, I'm really excited that we have a potential path forwards. We spoke about building web platform tests. So this is the idea of having shared tests that all of the browser vendors can run to make sure that their APIs behave consistently. And we spoke about embracing web platform APIs, like Devlin was saying, making sure that if there's a way that we can just use an existing API and give some additional capabilities, we do that so that a new developer coming to the extensions platform doesn't need to worry about learning a whole new set of APIs. They can just use the existing APIs that are available on the web and that uh, have been thought about uh, for, for a long time and have had a lot of thought put into them. We also spoke about moving forward with a specification. So this was one of the original things or the original deliverables that we wanted to have from the group. And I think we've only made a small amount of progress there. So we're really talking about what are the next steps? How can we break this work down? How can we try and share it out? And how can we, we move forward there? Because writing down how we want things to work, I think, is a good way to figure out those edge cases and make extension development easier for everyone. And then much more. There's lots of things that I don't have time to talk about, but changes to declarative net request, as I'm sure you're all excited about, the user scripts API, looking at the implications of web orphan and extensions, script execution from content scripts, back forward cache, service worker fetch events. These are all things that we've been talking about in the group. And if you want to see the full notes or join the group, you can go to the GitHub. So that's github.com forward slash W3C forward slash web extensions. And you can find out all the information. You can see the minutes from our meetings and, and see in detail what we've been talking about. But that's all from me. So I want to hand you to Devlin, who's going to wrap us up. Hey, folks. I'm back. Uh, so looking back at everything that we've kind of done this year, I, I got the impression that it's been both a very long and very short year. It seems like it's both flown by. And then I realized that Oliver started in January of this year. He's been here less than nine months. And I can't imagine going through any of this without having him in the community, because he's been such a crucial part. And so I feel like that's just been this overwhelming theme throughout this of both not having enough time and feeling like so much has happened. But more than that, I also think back to uh, how far the, the ecosystem has grown in that year. And I was talking with Nora about how much IO has grown in that year and talking with other developers about how, how vibrant the ecosystem has been, how much more innovation we've been seeing. And then looking farther back, I've, I've been in this space for close to 12 years now, and I usually get the question of why? Uh, 12 years seems like a lot of time, especially in the, the tech industry. I think Sebastian asked me this question just last night. Oh, you know, what, why are you still there? And part of it is the, the technology of extensions. It keeps me really interested because extensions do so much in the browser. And the whole point of extensions is to do anything you want that we can make you do easily and uh, within a safe manner. And there's just so much that you can possibly think of. But more than that, I, I think it's the, the ecosystem that, that keeps me here. It's, it's working with, with all of you and has been such an incredible journey to, to see how far we've come. And I know that when I started working on extensions, people said, yeah, that's, that's for power users. And when I told other people that I worked on extensions, they said, what? And then I said, you know, ad blockers. And they said, oh, OK. Now, now when I say I work on Chrome extensions, they say, cool. You know, I, I wouldn't use the browser without those. And that has been so incredible to see over these last years how much we've been just breaking into being a typical you know, household name of a product, of a platform, where people know what extensions are. And then looking ahead, I'm really excited to see where we're going, what we're going to do next, how we're going to incorporate with new features. There have been a ton of great talks here on what the, the cutting edge research is, what the area is. Everybody's talking about AI. 
and people say, oh yeah, AI, it's, it's gonna really change your, your industry, right? And my response is always, yes, I can't wait to see what extension developers do with it. I kind of sound like a broken record sometimes at work because anytime anyone comes to me and say, oh, have you tried an extension? Have you built an extension for that? Is there an extension API for that? And it's just because there's so much that this ecosystem can do. And so I'm just really excited to, to be a part of it and I just wanna thank every one of you for helping bring us there because we can't do this as, as one browser, we can't do this as all the browsers. We, we need the developer ecosystem there to help move us along. And this is such a crucial part of that and I've just had such a, such a blast coming to all of these meetings for the past now five years. And it's been so great to see how everyone can come together, how everyone can work together, bring feedback and how we're evolving the platform for our users. So I just wanted to say thank you for, for all of your hard work and we really could not do it without you. You make the platform, not us. So thank you. Q and A. Yeah. Yeah. I th I think the crowd can just take it away. <laughs> Questions. Oh no question. <laughs> Uh, I actually don't have any question. I, I just wanted to say thank you for your work, and I see a lot of improvements uh, for throughout this year and the previous years. And I'm very happy to see that extensions is not just a single guy somewhere in the basement uh, of of the Chrome building. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. Uh, thank you so much. That's how we knew we did a good job, was that Andre doesn't have questions for us. I think that's a new record. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's still an issue or not, but there's always been an issue with like uh, fake ad block extensions. Um, and I guess how, how proactive is the Chrome store to removing uh, repackaged fake extensions or nefarious extensions that, that obviously, you know, you know, people will search and find something that might take their personal data because it's been repackaged as an ad block extension. Uh, I can probably okay, go ahead. Uh, take that one. So uh, we, we do have some checks to, to see like uh, the reused packages and then take them down, but sometimes um, the developer can just do things and not really submitting the exactly same code and making this one hard. And so what the, uh, like, uh, the developer has is all the copyright can do is uh, to report the issue through the one platform support channel, and our reviewers, will, like they will actually res respond to all of those uh, escalation and be able to address those. Uh, and to add on to that, so uh, I think Sherry alluded to our spam policies. So if they directly copy another extension, we try our best to take down those copies that use the exactly the same code. Um, with duplicate or copycat extensions, um, there is a little bit of a gray area. So oftentimes they take that and add a little bit of a difference in, of a unique selling point. Uh, and then they say, we're different, we're better. Uh, and so there is a gray area that we have to work with every day, um, but we do our best to try to take down anything that's obviously a copycat or obviously like a malicious or uh, experience for yeah. users. And, and those are actually reviewed by our like uh, lawyer reviewers. And so you probably need to prove you really like own that copyright for that to take effect. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, in uh, current uh, station, we have a different uh, API of MV3 in Firefox and Google. Uh, even Pages and Ser Service Worker uh, is a different approach to manipulation with DOM uh, and uh, different events like on install and HK. Uh, do you have a plan to unify the standard of m management of uh, external workers in all browsers, like in the V3C group, for example? Th that's one of the main areas that we're focusing on is browser alignment. And so one of the interesting things about the extensions platform is that uh, it, it wasn't part of the, the web to begin with. It wasn't a cross-browser thing. Every browser had their own implementations of what the extensions platform was. 
and then we've eventually kind of naturally aligned on, on this version, but because it's been a less than traditional path forward for that, there's a lot of mismatches. And as you mentioned, some of that is the, the larger APIs, event pages versus service workers, and some of it's just behavioral differences where X API does this in this scenario in this browser, but not in this browser. And those are the types of things that we're looking at making more consistent in the WECG. Uh, I, I think that there's certain aspects that will be harder to align on that are going to take a lot of iteration. And I think that with those, one of the approaches that we're having is how can we make it as easy as possible for, for folks to have a cross-browser extension? So with the example of service workers, uh, Safari and Firefox are both implementing support for service worker extensions, or I think in Firefox it's not a real service worker, it's like a mocked up service worker environment. But the idea is that you should still be able to have that extension that works across all of these different browsers. And if we look towards the, the next three years, five years, we're hoping to reduce that gap so that even if the platforms aren't entirely identical, and we don't think they should be because browsers have different features, at least those features that are in common work the same way and there's not this question of what do I have to do to get my Chrome extension to work in Firefox or to work in Opera or to work in Brave or to work in Safari? Because we know that the, one of the best parts of the web is that it is the original, in my mind, still the best write once, deploy everywhere application. And so we, we want to embrace that as much as we can. I think I can add a little bit to that. Um, I, I think in the community group, we've seen, actually, in general, we're very aligned on like where we want to move the platform and the direction we're heading. So that's really exciting. Uh, one thing we do want to do is make sure that like browsers still have room to experiment and to try things. So it's not like our way is the best way. It's like, OK, we all see that we're trying slightly different things at the moment. But hopefully, over time, we can see what works and, and start to align more. So I, I think over time, hopefully, we're going to see more alignment, and it will become easier to Okay. Thanks, Lud. Hi. Uh, thanks for the update. It was very interesting. I'm curious if you can already uh, share more details about the timeline for the fast-tracked rules-only updates. You said it's coming soon, but how soon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you like next year? Okay. How about Middle next year. <laughs> <laughs> so AFDS 2024, we can give you feedback on how well it works. Uh, sorry, what? So on the Next Dev Summit next year. next year, we can give you feedback how well it yeah, works. Yeah, for sure. Cool, thanks. Mark your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> So follow-up question on that, actually. Uh, are you going to aim at certain response time for the fast track review? Uh, we actually like try to uh, focus on the safe rules and then to have like review without any human involvement, meaning it can be fast, as fast as we can scan and handle the package. Uh, so I think in most cases, it should be really fast especially if you upload and then after a long time to try to publish. Um, but like normally the scan, it would take a while. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry to do this again. So what what is what are safe rules exactly from a filter list, from a filter list perspective? So I, I, I consider obviously every rule I create is safe, but <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm a bit biased. But, uh, I think it's already an overloaded term, and we're only in the early days. Uh, so we we have a proposal in the community group, which is safe rules that we will allow to have a higher limit for dynamic rules. Um, and so right now our definition is fairly basic. It's things like block and allow rules. Um, allow or request upgrade scheme, and potentially the scope there to increase that in the future. So maybe certain types of redirects might be considered safe. Uh, and then I think for fast tracking the web store review, we have a very similar goal. So it's likely to use a very similar definition or maybe exactly the same definition. But I think exactly what that definition in that case is still a little bit of an open question. To expand on that a little bit, the, the motivation behind safe rules and the, the reason for the, the name, even though I, I think none of us are really attached to it, <laughs> uh, is that with these rules, the extension shouldn't be able to cause significant harm. 
where with things like declarative net request, if you redirect Google Analytics and jQuery, you basically own the internet. And you could redirect those to evil.com if you wanted. Uh, but there's only so much harm you can do with allow, block, or upgrade screen type rules. And so we have pretty high confidence that even if we don't have any type of review for those rules, it's still pretty safe for the user to have those exposed. And just as a quick reminder that like, the, the reason we're having all of these conversations is like we're not worried about any of you in the audience here. We have an entire ecosystem that don't attend these <laughs> summits and uh, maybe have shadier practices than folks that are in attendance here. And that's something that we have to keep in mind as we have these conversations about what's safe or unsafe. <coughs> Hi, thanks. Uh, just to echo what uh, Andre said, it seems like it's all really positive stuff that you were talking about today, so thank you. Um, I kind of wish I could ask you why you hate ad blockers again, but uh, you don't, <laughs> so, you know. Um, I did want to ask about the Chrome Web Store. I, went, I just had a look at it, and it asked me for my Google login. Uh, does it, is it not live yet? Is it the chromewebstore.google.com is where I went to. Chromewebstore.google.com, yeah. So uh, logging is not required to install extensions. You can do that, like other things, without the login. It redirected me to enter my Google account details. Oh, uh, OK, yeah. I mean, sounds like a, a, maybe a bug. OK. We'll, we'll <laughs> okay. That, but there's no intention to like a mandate Google account to install extensions. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right now, by the way, like that that is currently in an opt-in only. So that yeah. that's like a direct link to get to it. The uh. the typical user model is like if you go to the web store, you have an opt-in prompt and right. then that'll I'm, take you over. So uh, especially when it gets published publicly to everybody hundred percent, um, they will definitely not require sign in. We know a lot of users do not sign in. So is it meant to require the sign in now? Or? No, it's not. That is a bug. OK, cool. Yeah, that's a bug uh, I'm, I'm in Brave, by the way. Sorry. Uh, so I don't know if that makes a difference. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, thanks. Just, just a quick one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I keep some questions for the uh, browser panel, so uh, that, that's why I'm not asking something. Holding back. Double in. Uh, <laughs> Sherry, I just wanted to ask. Uh, I'm very excited about the fast track thing, so it, it's great that you will uh, do that. Uh, will be there any limitations on how often we can upload an updated extension with, uh, with the updated uh, st static rules? So if we do it, I don't know, every hour, uh, will it be a problem for Chrome Web Store? And quickly, the follow-up, uh, do you have the numbers on how quickly the updates are uh, actually received by the users? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so r regarding the update frequency, uh, so far we don't apply any quota there. Uh, there is an API quota. If you use the API, there is some quota. I think that's pretty generous, like QPI-based. Um, so if you want to do one hour, one update per hour, it's it's possible, but you probably don't need that frequent. And also, the review, if there's any review that take longer, because you cannot edit at the same time when you, the item is under review, so that may slow you down. Um, and uh, regarding the uh, update, how soon it reads the user machine, I think this one depends. Um, so in, in general cases, right, it's, like, it's actually like a take a while so it's like uh, seven days, about like 90% of users will get the updates because maybe they don't use their laptop often. Maybe they don't use their like, browser long enough each, in each session. Uh, but as an extension, there is a way to uh, kind of like request the update, mm -hmm. like, um, just like when you really need that. Or the user can actually also go to the developer, uh, turn on the developer mode, and then just a force update on all the extensions. And I would say, actually, I think this is a discussion I had with somebody yesterday, but we'd love to keep like, expanding the documentation on how the update process works and then how regular a user might get updates. I think that's a really great area to explore. Yeah, because it's passive, right? The update is passive. It more depends on the user, how do they use the browser, rather than how soon we want to distribute. It's always available immediately. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you have any plans to extend API for interaction with uh, Chrome Web Store? For example, setting maybe um, distribution percent? 
Uh, I thought we have that. Uh, we, yeah, so, yeah, that's something we're talking about as a team. Um, there's yeah, we, a number We already of, have that. So we, we have the ability to set it. It's, um, there's some fine-grained stuff we had talked about with that guard separately that, that's not currently available. Yeah. But in general, yes, we're looking to do that. And for that and any other feedback that y'all have, please contact uh, me, at least. I don't want to speak for everybody, but feel free to contact anybody, uh, or myself, rather, um, about feedback. Uh, we would love to make sure that uh, developer experience like the API can be improved in, or better documented in case it is already supported. And I have another one question about fast tracking. For example, in Edgard, uh, uh, along with uh, Declarative rules, we build also some source maps, which helps uh, for faster building our engine uh, and starting it. Uh, would it be considered like uh, just change of the rules or no? Uh, I, I think our first version, we will only be able to detect like rule file only changes. And then also within the rule file, you do only the safe types. So if you touch any other file, uh, unfortunately, it cannot be counted as a DNR only change. You can still go through the normal updates, though. Yeah. OK, then uh, I would say thank you to all of you, Cherry, Patrick, Oliver, David, Devlin.